Very exciting. It's great to see such a nice group here at the Creek Meeting House. And we have a nice group on Zoom. So this is wonderful. This is um, kicking off our new season of First Friday programs, although this is the second Friday due to, due to Labor Day. But um, welcome. Glad to see everybody. And um, as I do, my name is Cynthia Cook. If, if you don't know me, I'm the president of the Historical Society. And I usually do a few commercials, tell you about things that are going on before we get into the, you know, the main attraction, the, the feature film of the evening. So, um, for, and some thanks. First of all, I want to thank Elliot Werner, who just arrived. He is our program co-chair and does the work of communicating with our speakers and, and making sure everything is in order before they come. And he did that again with Will. So we're, we're grateful to him for that. I'm also very grateful to Kathy McMahon, who is on the Zoom end of things. And Kathy also does all of the publicity and make sure things are posted not only to newspapers, but to the web and to Facebook and to all those media. Um, she And we have Craig Marshall, of course, does the setup, does everything, um, soup to nuts. But he also works with Barbara and Herb Sweet to make sure that this hybrid program, both Zoom and in person, works well. So thank you, Craig. And I know we're going to have some refreshments afterwards. So we're grateful to Marjorie Fountain, who has set that up for us. Um, a few program notes, upcoming programs. Our next one will be Friday, October 6th, and it's going to be on architectural preservation by an architect named Joseph Vance. He is not the man who's working on the Creek Meeting House. We'll have to get him in here one day for a special program on, on what we're doing with this building. We also, on November 3rd, We'll have perspectives on landscape design in the Hudson River Valley. We're one of the places that romantic landscape design began. And we're delighted to have Harvey Flad, who is a professor emeritus um, from Vassar College, professor of geography, to come and talk about the romantic movement in landscape design and its origins here in the Hudson Valley. And the progressive dinner is coming up. It's going to be on October 21st, 21st, Saturday. And Lisa Novell, our program chair for the Progressive Dinner, is here. And I know she would love to hear from anybody, both on Zoom and in person, that um, is interested in hosting and attending. For those on Zoom, you can also always reach us at info at clintonhistoricalsociety.org. And that's our email address. And that's anybody can use that, and it's it's monitored, and we make sure the message gets to the right person. Um, I just want to make a few comments on the building restoration because it's a pretty big deal, and we're embarking on something quite exciting. Um, I was delighted over Community Day to see a wheelchair-bound individual make his way up using the foundation. That's just the gravel foundation for what will ultimately be the wheelchair ramp, making this building for the first time accessible to those with um, disabilities. It, we also will have two accessible parking spaces, one accessible restroom and upgraded um, exit hardware and emergency lighting. So that is step one that was provided to us through a grant from the Dutchess County Community Development Block Grant Program and then actually, thanks to Mr. Will Tatum, Dr. Will Tatum, our, our speaker this evening, there's also a, there was a grant available last summer called a Historic Infrastructure Grant. And we were awarded $30,000 through that program to begin to repoint the building. We're able to point new mortar in between the stones, plug up the holes where bats are getting into the building a real a, a mess and a health hazard. So both that and the accessibility program are beginning in October. I don't know if we're going to be able to have our October and November meetings in the building. We'll let you know. We'll find out as, as we go on that. But um, we are looking for people who want to help us 
raise the money, it's going to be over a million dollars before we're finished. So it's a big, big job and we need some help. People interested in fundraising, people interested in fundraising ideas, people interested in helping grant writing, which is something that I've been doing, but I, I could use some help on that. And then people interested in donating. So over, over on the table, you will find a stack of these one sheet forms, which tells you how to give and how to support the restoration effort. And now before we move to Will, I'm just getting everybody to anticipation builder. We had a special new membership promotion that took place over community day. Um, one day only, we were um, soliciting new members. And I'd like to have people raise their hands who are with us tonight for the first time as a result of that. Wonderful, great success, great success. Is there, are there any people out in Zoom land? I don't see any hands being raised, but that is fabulous. Welcome, we're delighted to have you. We hope that this is the beginning of a wonderful friendship that you'll <laughs> stick with us, thank you. And we, um, we thank Jim Brands <laughs> who came up with the idea of the membership promotion that worked so well. I think we had 35, 36 new mentors who came in as a result of it. So that's, that's just great. So um, thank you all. And now to Will. Um, Will has been our county historian since 2012. It's hard to imagine. It's been a fast decade. Um, <laughs> he's a native of Georgia. He was raised in North Carolina and received his BA in history and anthropology at the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. He, um, in 2003, he went on, to, oh, I'm sorry, only his BA at William & Mary. Then he went on to earn his MA and PhD in history at Brown in 2004 and 2016, respectively. So he's very well educated in history. From 2010 to 2012, he served as the Saul Feinstein Scholar at the David Library of the American Revolution, which is located in Washington Crossing, Pennsylvania. Um, north of Trenton. And then in October 12, uh, October 2012, he was appointed Dutchess County Historian. He works within the Office of County Clerk Brad Kendall and tackles a variety of ongoing projects. But first among those, and certainly the most favored for those of us in the history community, I think, is the indexing and imaging of the Dutchess County Ancient Documents Collection which includes the earliest court records. So we've had him here a couple of times telling some pretty um, rousing stories from those court records. Um, we are also personally at the Historical Society grateful to him for um, having digitized some of our earliest collections. We have archival material predating 1830. And those are also now available on the Dutchess County website. And I think you might not know some of the things that are there, there, but one of the most interesting is a collection of manumission records. That is freeing enslaved people who lived here in the town of Clinton in the early 19th century. And it's very interesting to read those records and find that not only did the owner, as it were, of the enslaved person have to be willing to make the person free, but then the town had the overseers of the poor would then review whether that person was in good enough health and young enough to be self-supporting so as not to become a burden to the community. And then finally, the town board would make that record, make that person free. So it was a very complicated process that I wouldn't have known anything about if it weren't for Will's project. Um, Tonight, he's going to be speaking on the hidden history in land records about Clinton's Gaisley Farm. He provides an inside perspective on the challenges and rewards of using land records as historical resources through the example of the Gaisley Farm, which is located on West, on West Meadowbrook Lane. He links it back to the Great Nine Partners patent. That's the beginning of all land ownership by white settlers in this in our community, providing a historical chain 
that connects the earliest era of European settlement in Dutchess County to the present day. And I'm happy to say that we have amongst us tonight the present day owners of that land. <laughs> Donald. Donald, Donald Kramer, Ron Kaplan, Cohen, sorry, who are um, CHS members and are a part of that link from the 1700s to today. So without any further delay, I'm happy to have Will take his place as he should here at the podium. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me in the back? It's the most important thing. For those of you who are online with us tonight, just a bit of housekeeping. Kathy McMahon, the fabulous secretary and uh, web mistress of the society is going to be monitoring the chat and also the interface. So if you have any problems, uh, just message Kathy and she will get Barbara Sweet, who is in the back of the room with us today to throw something at me in order to direct my attention. Those of you who decided to attend in person tonight can feel free to throw something at me whenever you like, whether you want attention or not, I don't take it personally. Thank you all very much for having me here at the iconic Creek Meeting House. This is really one of the most outstanding structures here in Dutchess County. And uh, if my plans go as planned, it will be the anchor point for our Quaker driving tour. That is one of the items we hope to roll out during Dutchess Rev 250 beginning in 2026. So we're all very excited to see how much effort you have put into maintaining and continuing to stabilize the building. And I'm, of course, always happy to support grant programs and to recommend that everyone, with all of those millions of dollars that you have stuffed into your mattress, you know, at least donate a couple of hundred thousand to the Clinton Historical Society because it is a very worthy project. All right. So his, hidden history and land records. As uh, Cynthia kindly noted, I'm more known in the county for talking about court records which are always super juicy. You know, we normally begin with dead and then we go to murder, violence, and then we end up with sex, which is just, you know, a, a formula that can't be beat. But over the past couple of years, especially since our COVID shutdown, I've been looking more and more into the resources in the county clerk's office because the county clerk's office has been the records holding agency of Dutchess County government since 1715. And especially under Brad Kendall's leadership, we've been making extraordinary progress and not only digitizing our own records, but assisting the local historical societies with digitizing those, which has the added benefit of sometimes you get into sort of strange stuff, things that most historians don't tend to look at. And among those are land records, because let's face it, unless you are a title searcher, you're probably not going to want to wade through the tons of legalese those of you who are homeowners might just have looked at that deed the day you did the signing and then quickly stuffed it away in the safety deposit box because, you know, legalese has improved a little bit over the past couple of hundred years. But uh, as our judge with us tonight would tell us, it hasn't improved that much. However, there are a lot of amazing details to be gleaned from land records, things that point us in directions that we might not otherwise think of for research. So we're going to, to make this as easy as possible tonight. We're going to begin with fun stuff, which is maps. Then we're going to go for a very hard but brief dive into the land records themselves. So, you know, gird yourself for a lot of legalese. And then we're going to pop back up again to talk about the secret language of basements. So just to give me an idea, did any of you happen to catch my article in the Northern and Southern Duchess News this week? By show of hands. Great, so this will be a surprise for most of you. That's exactly what I'm aiming for tonight. All right, so if I can just get to my control point. So first I'd like to begin with acknowledgements because often we look at books, we look at presentations and we think to ourselves, wow, this author has done so much work. And let me tell you, it takes a village as the metaphor goes to put together any kind of historical study. And when it's a historical study that I'm doing, it literally takes a whole count. So of course, at the top of the list here in Clinton will always be Bill McDermott. He has literally been doing Clinton history longer than I have been alive. So let that sink in for a moment. 
Dutchess County Clerk Brad Kendall gave me my initial education in all of these records that we are going to be talking about tonight. And then Don Cooksey, one of our title searchers extraordinaire, has pushed that in a, a whole new direction of looking at the, the incidental details, because often in title searching, you will come up against a brick wall. Georgia Herring, who is my part-time clerk, did a lot of the most thankless work of this presentation, which is transcribing all of the squiggly writing into the nice uh, word processed excerpts that you will see tonight. And we owe a lot of this project to Historic Red Hook, particularly Claudine Close and Emily Major, who did a great deal of legwork on this. And anytime you do a house history, try to do it as a team activity that makes it much more manageable. Bill Jeffway and Melody Moore have provided all sorts of support, including most especially and importantly, pointing out things that were right in front of my face because, you know, when you get close enough, my vision just blurs out. We also have the New York State Archive staff. You'll see some of the material tonight that they maintain for us. And goodness knows if it wasn't for them and the generations of Dutchess County local historians who preceded me and who serve today. We would have lost just about everything that is powering tonight's presentation because the land records, as interesting as they are, are perhaps not as riveting as they would be without the other stuff we're going to see. So remember that our story tonight is about process. We are pulling back the curtain on how one does a house history, and we're not going to be covering everything from the current owners back to the great nine partners. I thought about that and then I realized it would probably take three hours because once you get into the great nine partners, things get, get a little weird, get a little strange. It's like the pieces of yarn connecting the, the newspaper articles that you have pinned to the wall or maybe that's just me doing what I do in the library. But uh, we're going to make this a little bit more manageable as a sample. So our prompt tonight is that our friends on Meadowbrook Lane won an auction item with Historic Red Hook last fall, which is a house history. And they exploited a very clever loophole because Historic Red Hook never thought to put in the item description, we only do house histories of buildings in Red Hook, which I'm thankful for because this has been an amazing opportunity to really delve into title searching and house histories around here. Red Hook, to my knowledge, is only one of two historical societies that offer these items, the other one being the Dutchess County Historical Society. And for my sins, I do the Dutchess County Historical Society's annual house history research, more or less by myself. I do my best to get Bill and Melody involved, but uh, oftentimes I'm down there digging into the, the depths of our title change by myself. So so keep those items in mind. Might be a good fundraiser for the Clinton Historical Society to uh, offer a house history, especially since you have a beautiful volume, which if you're online with us, drop the society a line to see about ordering it. If you're here in person, you can pick up a copy as you go. It is their historic structure survey, which is much more than just a dry list of structures. It is a wonderful write-up on many of the wonderful and documented historic properties here that looks beautiful and tells you nothing about all of the work that goes into this stuff. But that's what tonight is about, to clue you in. So this is our house. It seems so lovely, so innocent, just sitting there minding its own business. And this is why folks tend to lose track of the fact that, well, house histories are actually the most complicated type of local history project to do. You might think genealogies are tough, and by all means they are, but house histories take genealogy one step further because you go into all sorts of records that even genealogists won't normally touch, but they are a mutually informative exercise. In other words, as you'll hear a little bit tonight, genealogies inform house histories Will? and house histories get us Will? to look Will? differently at genealogies and also give us some, uh, some thoughts. Yes. Will? It's Kathy, you're not sharing your screen with us. We are pausing for a moment for a technical intervention. Let's see if we can remedy that. I'm, I'm seeing I'm fine. This is Glenda. I'm this not is seeing always the, joy the slideshow. Of, uh...
All right, let's see if this will work. Tell me if this is coming up now. Good, good, good. I mean, you all here with me tonight can see this. All right, so you all see a house in front of you. This is the quiet, unassuming house. That one right there. You can unfortunately see the, uh, let's see if we can take care of that just a second. We can maybe minimize. Oh, well, I'm afraid for those in person, you might have to put up with that toolbar up top, but hopefully it doesn't distract too much. Those on Zoom, you'll have a wonderful view. All right, so we have this house. Where do we begin with house history? Well, I like to start with Dutchess County Parcel Access, and this is free online. You can use it 24-7, 365. It's courtesy of both the Dutchess County Office of Central and Information Services, our real property office, and to a large degree, the county clerk's office. And when you put in an address, and I, I won't share your address tonight, partly because there is the usual disagreement between what the United States Postal Service thinks your address is and what the town and county authorities think your address is. And, you know, we're going to be confusing enough without having to get into the weeds on that. But you can see that if you enter an, a, uh, an address into this thing, up will pop this beautiful parcel map. It's highlighted what we're looking at today. Now, I should point out that technically this is two historic parcels that have been joined together. We're only going to be talking about the one that has the house on it tonight. So, and um, for the owners who are here with us tonight, don't worry, Claudine has all of the bells and whistles ready for your report. So you see it there. It's a little bit down from um, where, goodness, Pleasant Plains is with the beautiful church. We're going to take a look at the Google Maps view because it's a little bit cleaner than parcel access. That blue marks basically, but not quite exactly where the home is located. So we have the Pleasant Plains Presbyterian Church up there to the left, which is technically up to the northwest. You see Hollow Road going down. Meadowbrook Lane splits off, and uh, you have Rimps Road, and I did promise the judge that the Rimps would appear. Here you go. All right, so where do we begin? Well, I was taught by uh, Don Cooksey and also through the excellent work of the late Stephanie Maury to look at our historic maps of Dutchess County first, just to see, all right, has someone 150 years ago done some of the legwork for me? Because the whole idea in history is build on the shoulders of what other people have done because rebuilding the wheel is really intense and takes a lot of time. So I popped in my favorite starting point, which is the 1850 Gillette map of New York or of Dutchess County. And here we see Pleasant Plains. We see a road going down. We see, oh, look, Jay Rimp down there at the bottom. So that's probably Rimp Road, but there's a little something missing here because this, this road that we see going down doesn't have that intersection that we see on the modern map. There's a road missing. Just to, to connect the dots for you, Meadowbrook Lane is missing. And where Meadowbrook Lane would actually split off from the 1850 map is where you see that name A. Gaisley. And don't worry, we'll get to the reason why it has an A in it. So, all right, we've got a Gaisley there. Now I'm wondering, when exactly does that road come in? And I'm sure none of you thought that you would be getting some highway history tonight, but it is a big part of the Dutchess County story. So we go to my next favorite map, which is in color, the 1858 map. And now we see E. Gaisley. We see a bunch of rimps down here, so pretty safe to bet that's Rimp Road. We've got Hollow Road, but we still don't have Meadowbrook Lane. When is it going to turn up? If you guess the next map, you might be correct. So here, finally, 1867, we have Meadowbrook Road. And how many are Meadowbrook Lane? How many of you would have guessed that it is that old or alternatively that it is that young? But as you can see, E. Gaisley and the Pine Grove Farm are sandwiched right there at that intersection. So this is an automatic tip off that, okay, not only do we probably have a historic structure here, but we now have a name to do title searching with which is awesome, but we're not quite there yet. We've got a few more maps to look at. Look at the 1876 atlas just to see, all right, has the name changed? Nope, it is still, even though it's difficult to see up there because the 
the scan quality is a little light. It's still a Gaisley, although it looks like an X there at the intersection of what is today Hollow Road and Meadowbrook Lane. Now we're going to take it way back in maps, and this is probably not going to be terribly uh, easy to see. It's a very faded out map, but this is one of our earliest maps of the town of Clinton, 1797. It's part of a general survey that was supposed to have been done of every town and every county in New York in 1797. Unfortunately for many of our friends, including those who, for example, live in Pauling, some of these maps have not survived. But luckily for all of you, the map of Clinton, Stanford, Washington, and Amenia together, it is a huge map, has survived and has been not only preserved by our friends up at State Archives, but also high resolution scanned and available for free as a TIFF file, which I downloaded. So even though this is difficult to see, don't worry, we're about to make it interesting and zoom in. So that is not just all of Clinton, it's all of Hyde Park, because modern Hyde Park did not split off until 1821. And I hope I got that right. I'm sure Craig will throw something at me if I uh, was off by year. So on that map, you'll see that we have this, this beautiful detail of a list of all sorts of buildings and owners and whatnot that are there. And we start to see the Gaisley name popping up immediately. So we've got Ben Gaisley at number 20. We've got this building right here, the Friends Stone Meeting House at number 25. And then we have another Gaisley, John Gaisley, with both a grist, a sawmill, and a house at number 34. Don't worry, we're going to get to a detail of the map that'll show you where that is immediately. But I just want to make a plug for our friend Bill McDermott's History of Clinton one of his earlier volumes because he talks a lot about the Gaisley family in there. They were early settlers here in the 18th century and they did a lot of industrial work and storekeeper work. Now, where did those points turn up on that map? And my apologies to the folks online. I'm gonna turn around to see exactly how well this is showing up for our friends here in person. I mean, that's not terrible. So at the, up at the top, you see 20, that is where Ben Gaisley's tavern is. Now, the thing about 20 is if you look up at the very top of the image there, you'll see that you've got what is basically the top of the town of Hyde Park today and then the top of the town of Clinton. If you look at a modern map and you draw a line due south, you will hit Pleasant Plains. In fact, you'll pretty much intersect with modern location of the Pleasant Plains Church. Now, I'm not saying that 1797 was the height of map making accuracy and that that's where Ben Gaisley was exactly. But, you know, in that area where his uh, his descendant, L. Nathan, uh, L. Nathan, actually, Gaisley would come to live. 25, you see over there to the far edge, that is uh, the Friends Meeting House where we're sitting today. Also a collection of stores. That might be something we can talk about in a future program. And then way down at the bottom next to a Vly, that's spelled V-L-Y, that's Dutch for essentially a swampy piece of ground that is seasonally a pond, but on off seasons is more of a swamp or a meadow, has been as John Gaisley's Griston Sawmills and House. So we have Gaisley's here from a very early period for Clinton, but you know, they're not really where L. Athan is going to be by that 1850 map. So the uh the search continues, but we've now exhausted the sort of the low hanging fruit. You can do all of this research online. For the next part of our program, this is where it might get a little painful. There's going to be a lot of squiggly writing. You have to go to one of my favorite places on earth, which is the second floor of the Dutchess County office building, the county clerk's record room. And all of those books that you see in the, it's called a bunker in front of you there. Those are our grantor and grantee indexes. So the grantor indexes have all of the sellers by last name. So you can look them up and then it's arranged by date. We'll see a, a detail image in just a bit. The grantees are the buyers. So theoretically, and those are all of our records from pre-1950. If you want something more recent, that's even easier because a large chunk of that is online searchable. So what happens if you need to go into the past, as I did? Well, and this is the only animation I've used tonight. It seems to have worked. I count that as a huge win. You get something like this. So this is the index of grantees. This lists the Gaisleys. It's very 
apropos of the period that it was made in. That's the 1950s from our one of our most famous county clerks, Fred Smith, you know, the only man who could probably stand in Brad Kendall's shadow and still shine. But he had all of this work done. But this is where title searching generally begins to get into the hard stuff, because, yes, you have the cross indexed buyers and sellers. You can derive a lot of material from these records. Prior to the 20th century, there was really, and there still isn't today technically, a requirement to file your land deeds at the county clerk's office. Now, why wouldn't you do that? Today, it's a matter of course. You're not required to do it, but uh, your title search company and your land lawyer are all going to insist that you do that. It's a wonderful mechanism set up to it, because as long as the government holds a copy of your deed, title to your land is insured by the government. And we have all of those things microfilmed. We've got a quadzillion copies of it. But if you go back to the 18th century and even for a good chunk of the 19th century and you don't live near Poughkeepsie, especially if you live in Eastern Duchess, it's a real trial to get to Poughkeepsie. So you know, as long as you're pretty sure that you're gonna be able to keep your copy of the deed someplace where it won't get destroyed, you're not gonna to go to the time and the expense to make that journey to Poughkeepsie. One of the funnier things I've found in my title searching is you'll see 18th century deeds that are actually filed in the early 20th century, the 1920s and 30s, where the family who has held the land for generations is finally selling it. And clearly someone has gone to them and said, hey, we're a little worried about the title to this land because we don't see anything on file at the county clerk's office, to which, of course, I imagine the answer was digging around in a trunk, coming up with a handful of really old paper, and then being told by an attorney, you know, it's 1924. It's not that hard to get to Poughkeepsie. There's bus service. Why don't you go down to the county clerk's office and file this? It doesn't cost that much. So we see a big blooming of uh, filings of this material at that time. So as a, a team effort between Emily Major, Claudine Close, and myself, digging into all of these files, beginning with the current deed, working our way back, we come to this section that I'll discuss tonight, which is the real historical chunk of this property history. This is the chain of title, is the technical term. And bear in mind, most historians will start at a point in, in the past and work forward. When you're doing title searching, you start at the present and work backwards. And that's sort of like trying to walk backwards, which is uh, challenging at times, but you get used to it after a while. Your eyes cross, they uncross, they move independently, and then they, they sink back into position again. And that's where those maps help, because as you are doing that backwards walk through the title records, if you find something that lines up with one of those maps, it helps confirm that you are on the right track, because there are frequently lines of research that don't exactly pan out. But here, what we have going backwards, of course, is the, the first deed in that section would be the 1936 deed from Mabel Gaisley to Carl and Margaret Seelbach. And then you see a pretty much unbroken line of deeds that are within the family back to 1845, well, with Elathan Gaisley. And you might notice that those spellings change a little bit over time. That's not unexpected. Some people like an extra E more than other people do. I think like more E's the better, get rid of that Y on the end, just make it three E's at a fourth. But I'm an 18th century historian and spelling back then a whole different ball game. And then of course we get to this weird one, which are the plats. And I say that the plats are weird because they don't turn up on that 1797 map. So there's a bit of a mystery about exactly where they come from. However, I partially potentially resolved that mystery really late this afternoon when I just decided to follow a, a crazy line of research, but we'll get to that in the end. So our story today, I'm going to be telling in the proper direction, which is from the past moving forward so that we can see how these land records work. So we're gonna start with that 1831 deed from John Platt to his son, Isaac Platt. And this is what that deed looks like. So this is a scan from microfilm because the original is kept at the, the county, well, not technically the offices, in the record room, because it's kind of an old book from 1831. It looks much better than I would if I was born in 1831, 
but we like to keep those things in a more climate controlled environment, you know, where I'm not paging through them every day. So you get to, to do a lot of microfilm reading. And uh, my assistant, Georgia Herring, did that. And so she translated all that squiggliness that you see on the left into all of that beautiful type stuff that you see on the right. And this is where the legalese comes in. This indenture made the first day of March in the year of our Lord, 1831, between John Platt of the town of Clinton and the county of Dutchess and state of New York of the first part, and Isaac I. Platt, the same place, son of the said John Platt of the second part, witness it, yada, yada, yada. They're going to talk about all the money. They're going to talk about in early 19th century speak that the title is free and clear. No one has line or liens on it. No one has other claims on it. And uh, what John is doing in this case is he's adding his son, Isaac I. Or Isaac I. Platt, to the title. So they're sharing the property. He's not turning it directly over to his son, but there's joint custody. And of course, the part uh, in the program description of taking it all the way back to the nine partners, it's in italics, either on your screens or on the, the projector base behind me, is that it was originally part of lot number four in the third division of the Grain, Great Nine Partners Pat. And this is why we're stopping in 1831, because the Great Nine Partners patent, as its name implies, was a very large piece of property. It's basically 10 miles wide, measured north to south, starts at the Hudson River, goes all the way to the Connecticut border. I'm not exactly sure how many tens of thousands of acres of land that is. My, my head is already hurting from just thinking about how many acres of land that is. And as you can see there, lot number four in the third division. This land patent begins in 17, or in 1697. They divide it up at least three times. I suspect probably a fourth. We do have records of what the patentees, and we're talking about multiple generations of patentees because of the period under question. We do have records of what they were up to from 1730 onwards. But that's the sort of deep dive that would, you know, have us here for a couple of more hours so I can come back in the future and uh, clue you in on all of that journey. But for now, just a couple of things to point out again about the strength of land records here. There's a whole lot of legalese to dig through, but immediately we see, hey, we've got a genealogical dimension here. Because not only do we have some names that are definitely associated with the property that we can dig up, this record tells us about a genealogical link. It's a father and a son, which can be really hard to establish otherwise if you don't have a family Bible or a church record that enters birth. So right there, you've got an establishment of a family relationship. It tells you about the land title record because it automatically takes you back to the great nine partners, which is not always the case. The later you go in time, the less the deeds say about the previous owners, which is, you know, not the, the best part of doing title searching, but it's something you learn to live with. And then, of course, down at the bottom of that, you've got uh, beginning one chain and 50 links on a course north, three degrees west from a stake and stones standing in the north line of Levi and John Van Vliet's land. You've got all of the stuff that we make a lot of fun of in terms of how lot boundaries were established, but it's kind of important. So remember, this is just the bottom of one page of this deed. It's two and a half pages altogether. This is the second page. All of this stuff that you see typed up is on that page. And this, of course, is just bullet points that takes out some of the more painful aspects of the legalese. Now, I've put things in italics and underlining for you to point out the real big takeaways, don't be confused as uh, I was when I first began by chains and links and all the rest of that sort of stuff. That's how they did math in medieval England because a chain is 66 feet and it literally is a chain made up of 100 links and surveyors would literally not do this themselves, normally have some poor uh, fellow who didn't know what they were doing or when they volunteered to do it, drag these things through the woods between these various surveying points to make sure everything was laid out correctly. So each of those links, because there's a hundred in a chain, 0.66 feet, roughly two thirds of a foot. How that makes sense, 
I guess we should ask William the Conqueror because this stuff goes all the way back to the Doomsday Book, which is why, again, all of those minutes and degrees and chains, that makes sense to surveyors. What we want to look at are the boundary languages in here because that tells us a lot. So first of all, slot number four in the third division of the Grank Nine Partners patent, as we've already mentioned, that takes us back to the 18th century. And again, this is 1831, so it's really nice to have that clue about where this might fall in the 1790s or the 1770s. Our second point, a stake in stones. All right, stake in stones. It's pretty, that's actually pretty advanced for this era because they made a marking point instead of just carving into a nearby tree. Well, don't worry, the, the carvings into trees come up. But that sort of gives you, if you own an older property here in Dutchess County, and even if your house is not old, the property it stands on probably is, and you've got pieces of stone wall there or just random piles of rock, those might be survey points. So, you know, think about that before you rob them for the garden, which I've been tempted to do every now and again. So the road leading from said Van Vliet's to John Leroy's Mill, beginning in the middle of the road, that's a pretty standard thing before the 20th century is that your property line extends to the middle of the road. That's not a coincidence because it helps make you legally responsible for maintaining the road. That's one of the beauties of living in Dutchess County before the Department of Public Works existed or before your town DPWs existed. But this also, if we go back to, to a couple of maps, we might be able to actually trace that out. And then, of course, the inevitable white oak tree marked. OK, that's probably not here anymore, but but thanks for trying. And again, this will be, the importance of this will become more evident in just a bit. More stake and stones, more stake and stones. A walnut sapling marked on three sides. Who knows how? They don't say. Was it chalk? Was it carved in? Was it painted? We don't know, but there are stones around the base of it. So, you know, if you find a super duper old tree that has stones grown into it around it, again, a potential survey marker. Oh, but here's the big thing. Easterly part of the large gate in front of the dwelling house on this farm. Most of the standard legalese of these title documents will refer to appurtenances and buildings being on the, the lots. When you see all of that stuff listed together, you can't really assume that that actually means there is a building on the lot. Because as those of you who have either experienced uh, the legal profession or title searching know, a lot of this is just rote. So when you see them calling out a dwelling house with a gate in the boundaries, that's a huge clue that, oh, no, actually, there is a building on this site. So we now know there was a building there by 1831 and probably earlier, super duper important. All right, so our next point, a survey made in 1828. That means that maybe somewhere floating around out there, there is a survey map of this property. Unfortunately, it's not on deposit at the Dutchess County Clerk's Office because again, why would you go from Clinton all the way to Poughkeepsie in 1831? There are no buses, so not quite so easy. But again, a clue about something else. Yes, sir. So the question is, are all of these bearings, these degrees and minutes that you see in there to magnetic north, it was as close to magnetic north as they could achieve in the 1830s with their instruments. So yes, that uh, there are a wonderful variety of survey instruments that still exist in very expensive collections because they were little works of art, but they had to have them because otherwise you just can't establish directionality. And one of the reasons why we have all of these title documents still preserved, super duper important to have accurate boundaries on your land. A good chunk of the ancient documents, those uh, legal records are actually about boundary disputes over land and who is actually built, you know, it's not a garage back then. It's normally a dwelling on someone else's property. Same sort of thing that you have today with jacuzzi. Yes, sir. Uh, I know you want to don't want to go back all the way to the nine partners, folks. But don't worry, we're we about know, to get we there. We know which of the nine partners have where we wish to So the question is, do we know who happened to have lot number four of the third division of the nine partners, the great nine partners? Because there's a second nine partners patent. Uh, 
no, we don't like originality that much in 18th century Dutchess County. I do not have that information at hand tonight, but I may have found something that can get us there. That's going to take some more digging, a lot of it in the Dutchess County Historical Society's collections, because they maintain those land records along with a bounty of other material that has been saved over the years. So we've got that survey in 1828. And then, of course, we've got another piece of the nine partners because this is bounded on the south by lot number five in the third division. So provided I can find a third division map, and if Bill Jeffway is watching tonight, he far exceeds me as a researcher, he's probably already found it somewhere either online or in the County Historical Society's collections, we will be able to zoom in further. All right, so you've got all this stuff. How does that help us, especially with these lot divisions? So the question is, it might be in your mind already, what does the Great Nine Partners patent look like? Steal yourselves, because that is a map that we have on deposit in the Dutchess County Clerk's Office. Deposit, file, it's filed. Brad will make sure that I use the correct terminology on this. So here we have map number four of the Great Nine Partners patent drafted in 1734. This might not look so 1734-ish to you, might look a little bit modern. It's because in the 1920s, a lot of this stuff was in horrific, terrible, not going to make it in the long haul shape. So the then county clerk had tracings made of them. And those folks were a lot better with a pen and ink than I would be today, thank goodness. So this is a 1920s verified copy of this map. And you can see it's not a joke. It's 10 miles from its southern boundary to its northern boundary, and it goes all the way from the Hudson River all the way out to Connecticut. And that string of lower lots that you see on the left with the river, those are the famous water lots because they divided this thing up all sorts of ways. 1734, I'm not sure which of the divisions that is. I'm going to hazard a guess that it's probably the second division because in 1697, they made the patent, but there's all sorts of stuff that, again, we could spend a lot of time talking about of how they go from stabilizing the patent to subdividing the patent. It's a whole separate kettle of fish. It's very complicated, involves a lot of stuff back and forth with authorities in London, which, you know, in 1697, that's like a three month, if you're lucky, chain of communications. But, of course, you're probably saying, Will, this is a ridiculously large map. Why are you making us look at this? Don't worry, because here's the detail. So you can see happily the folks in 1924 who copied this put down the modern towns. You see town of Clinton up there, Pleasant Valley. They didn't confuse us by putting the town boundaries on. So it's a little bit of guesswork there. But if you look closely, you will see a series of sort of small rectangular lots going north, south. They are numbered three, four, five, et cetera. Those are the so-called 700-acre lots. You know, you've heard of Winnie the Pooh and the 1,000-acre wood. In Dutchess County, we have the Great Nine Partners 700-acre lots. And just to make sure that it's not too terribly clear, the lots on the other side of those 700-acre lots, these are things like 3,600-acre lots, are numbered the same as these 700-acre lots. So when you say lot number four of the third subdivision, do you mean the 700 acre lot third division or do you mean the 3600 acre lot of the third division? This is why I need a couple of more months to, to dig into the details on this. This is why you pay people a large amount of money to do title searching for you. Because again, it makes your eyes go in all sorts of weird directions. All right, so we've got the Platts there, John Platt and Isaac I. Platt. Now it's time to take a jump to where the Gaisleys come. Now remember, they've been around in, in Clinton for a while now, but it's not until 1845 that Elathan Gaisley actually buys the farm in, in the literal sense, thankfully not the metaphorical sense. He will live for quite some time from this point from John and Isaac I. Platt. So we have this deed on Liber 79, page 577, it's huge. You can tell that they were a little bit bored when they took it down because they didn't even bother to note the day and the month of 1845 in which the sale was actually signed between the Platts and the Gaisleys. They did, however, you know, note all of those boundary things that we love. 
including that important point, east gatepost in front of the dwelling house in these premises. Now, if you paid attention to that chain of title um, table that we had up, and don't worry, you'll see it again in, in just a moment if you're beginning to forget the particulars, as I sometimes do. When I do all of this putting together of the title search, I have at least two screens, if not three, so that I can display all of these uh, documents simultaneously. We're going to get to uh, the points here, but we do have a different set of boundary markers here, which is, you know, is not unusual. It does suggest that the Platts made some purchases and some sales between the time they acquired the property and even between the time that John decided to share title of the property with Isaac. But it again moves us forward in time to getting closer to where we want to be. So here you go again, the long written list, and then, of course, your typed out list, courtesy of George Herring. So now, instead of uh, beginning at a different point, we're going to begin with the southwest corner of James Filkins' farm at a stake set in the corner of the wall. So again, walls, important features. James Filkin doesn't really turn up on any of these maps. Another Filkin turns up in the 1850s. It's to the northeast of the current property. So, you know, beginning at the southwest kind of makes sense for that big square. And then, of course, we have the magnetic needle now points. It's going to go again, east gate post in front of the dwelling in these premises. It's really nice and really important to have this level of, you know, sameness and coherency and continuity between these various land records, because that really tells you that you're at the right place. And for those who are interested in house histories, it tells you that that house is still standing there. So it's been, you know, what, 14 more years. Those houses were built to stand. Many of them are still here today, including this one, by the way. We'll get to that in a second, though. Then you have the southwest corner of the dooryard, another indication that there is a structure here that's actually being used and dwelled in because dooryards are where most of your domestic work happens, at least in decent weather. Then we're going to go again to the middle of the highway. So we've got some nice continuity there. We go to the middle of a wall. Oh, here we go. The rock oak tree marked. Is it marked with rocks? Is it an oak tree made of rocks? Are there rocks around it? Who knows? But we've got a tree and we've got rocks. We've got our stakes and stones all over the place. A maple sapling that's marked. Who knows what that would have looked like 30 years later. Middle of the wall between a chestnut and a walnut tree. <coughs> Excuse me. And then finally, the junction of two walls for getting back to the place of beginning. All right. How assuring is this in terms of making the link back to the flats? Well, you've got the same language that's talking about the highway. You've got the same language that's talking about the dwelling house, which is super duper important. But a lot of the rest of this has changed, as has the lot size. The Platts describe their lot as being 100 acres. The, this deed here describes the lot as being 112 acres and then some change, which we're not going to get into because that's even more archaic measurements like rods, which... That's something for a different occasion. The cool thing about this, and remember how I promised you that you would see that table again? Well, here it is. Is that language from 1845 is in every deed up to 1936. And those owners in 1936, the seal box have it until the 1970s, when it's subdivided up to make part of the seal box housing development and a bunch of other things happen that are a bit more modern than I'm comfortable with. The, the further away we stray from pre-1830s Dutchess County, the more I like to lean on other historians who know those eras better. I'm a guy of the really squiggly writing era. So, but you see there that that language is the same for a shocking amount of time, basically over a century. Now, does that mean that those saplings are still saplings? Probably not. This is probably the, the result of some uh, let's say people in the legal profession who are seeking to do things quickly and easily rather than necessarily bringing out a surveyor to resurvey the land, because as those of you who perhaps had a property survey done today, it's not an inexpensive undertaking. It certainly was not an inexpensive undertaking back then where someone would have to literally ride a horse or a wagon out to your property to drag all of these chains around. 
What it does tell us, however, is that there's stability on this land plot over time, which is not unusual for Dutchess County, but it's really good to see that dwelling mentioned over and over and over again, because it tells us there is an old house on this property, at least up through the 30s, because unfortunately in the 1970s, they decide to stop talking about what's actually on the land anymore and just go back to the boilerplate of the appurtenances and dwellings and all that other stuff, which does not necessarily tell you nothing, but I find it better not to count on that being indicative. So now for those of you who did not read that article in the Northern Southern, Southern Duchess News, prepare to be amazed because there is one final test that we can do to establish whether a building is super duper old or built on the site of something super duper old or is entirely a more modern fabrication. And that is the secret language of basements. And I really, I owe this one to Emily Major because Emily Major was the first person to take that Shakira song that was big in the early 2000s and adjust it a bit to say basements don't lie. And basements like hips really don't lie because for those of you who've been in your houses for a long time, unless you have a finished basement, which is a super duper modern thing, you probably like me spend as little time in your basement as possible because the least fun things to do with your house are down in your basement. That's where your mechanicals are located. That's often where the, the plumbing is located. You know, the plumbing that you cross your fingers every day of your life and hope doesn't leak and you've got that nagging feeling in the back of your head that I haven't had the water heater maintained in a couple of years. I hope the bottom is not rotted out. That's what happens in basements. The good news is that neglect means that people don't generally go and you know renovate basements like they do basically every other part of the house. And for those of you who may wonder how I can speak with such passion, I have an 1820s house up in Red Hook and uh, the basement is the one reliable part of the house because it has gone through so many partial renovations that it's really difficult to tell what's old, what's new, and what's in between. Now, our owners were very kind to allow Claudine Close and Emily Major to come crawl around their basement. They took a few photos. I'm only going to share the coolest ones tonight, so don't worry. Now, the things we look for, basements don't lie because, again, they have no reason to lie. You're not going to bring your company over unless you're a weird historic house person like me and say, let's start with the basement and then we'll work our way up to the more boring stuff. Because when you go down to this basement, you see a hand hewn timber. That's a pretty good indication, especially this one that still has the ads marks on it. That's the tool that kind of looks like a hoe, but isn't. That's an indicator definitely of pre 1830s, really of even earlier than that. By the 1830s, you're seeing, you know, not only saw pits around, but the introduction, not necessarily here in Dutchess County, but you sometimes see it on the timber of more modern style of saw works, the ones that use circular and leave those circular marks. There ain't no circular marks here. There's not even the up and down marks that you see of the more sophisticated saw pit operations of the early 19th century, where you wouldn't see any ads marks because you wouldn't need it. You had two guys, one standing down in the pit, talk about a terrible job because you end up literally caked in sawdust at the end of the day and one person standing above the tree trunk and you are running the saw between the two of you. That's much cleaner and ads normally means that this has been squared up by hand, which can be a mark of earliness. Again, think about the fact that your house builders of the 18th and 19th century are probably in the business if they live long enough for a couple of decades, they're not gonna reinvent the wheel. So we see things here in Dutchess County that are kind of old fashioned sometimes for the era that they're built in, but again, you see wide plank floors sitting directly over top of this pretty big post, at least for a floor joist. And you see two forms of additional support, another wood column below it, and then a lolly column next to it, which is a fine old Dutchess County tradition. You will see this in my house because as long as the floors stay up and your sills aren't rotted through, it's a pretty good bet that your house will uh, last at least as long as you do, if not indeed further on. But then the really choice bit, I, I'm saving it for last here, and I do want to tease you just a little bit. This is where the genealogy comes in, 
And a huge thanks to Claudine Close for digging this up and sending this to me. I've been wondering, how do we get to the Platts in Clinton? Because, yeah, we've got Gaisleys around, we've got Van Vliet's, we've got Stoutenberg's, we've got all those folks, but Platts just don't seem to show up on maps, which is funny for two reasons. Because technically, property survey maps are Platt maps, so you could have a Platt map of the Platt property. Yeah, I know. Trust me, in the history world, it's really dry jokes. The other part is that the Platts here in Dutchess County are actually responsible for founding Plattsburgh up in northern New York. So Dutchess County is everywhere. Where do the Platts come in? All right, here is the genealogy chart for you all. You're reading from right to left in terms of oldest to youngest. So Eliphalat Ella Platt, yes, yeah, say that five times fast. He is the pre-revolutionary generation. His son is the John Platt that we see in that 1831 deed. John Platt has a couple of sons himself, including, including Isaac I. Platt, who is on that 1831 deed, he shared interest in the property. And then a son named after his father in that final tradition, Eliphalat Platt, who becomes a doctor in Rhinebeck. John Platt ends up moving down to Pleasant Valley, for those who might be wondering. Isaac I. Platt ends up being a general um, after the War of 1812 and living his days out in Poughkeepsie. And you can see the rough dates there. Dr. Eliphalat Platt, the younger Platt, Born in 1797, dies in 1868. Isaac I. Platt, born in 1802, dies in 1866. Why is this important? Because our friends who have the house today have real treasure in their basement, like more so than the beams. They have graffiti, which probably upset someone a long time ago, but is super handy to have for house history today because basically right next to each other because you see the hinge beginning in the right view and then you see the end of it in the left view. You have IP 1823 and then EP 1823. And that is almost like 99.99% .99 certainly to be Isaac I. Platt and Eliphat Platt who either are reusing boards that were on a package that were sent to them or were really bored in 1823 and decided to go down to the basement and paint this stuff on. You know, another clue that we look at, if you look at that hinge that's above the red EP in 1823, it's a pancake style hinge that's pencil mounted, which means that, you know, that part that the, sin, that the hinge is standing on is actually hot hammered. It's heated up to not quite red hot, but enough to burn its way into that timber and is pounded into that timber and then the hinge hung over it. That's, that's definitely out of style by 1810. You know, you'll sometimes see it afterwards because, hey, you know, if you learned how to do this stuff in the 1790s, it was good enough in the 1790s, it's still good enough when your career is coming to an end in the 1820s. Normally we like to say these things are at their height in the 1780s, but that means it could be older. I'm comfortable saying that this is a, an early 19th century, maybe end of the 18th century house. So the bombshell, in terms of what I found today, Ella Flat Platt marries the daughter, or at least one of his wives, is the daughter of one of the, I think it's the second generation of patentees. They're either Costins or Canstons, depending on which document you look at. And I dug up a deed today, just a shot in the dark that turned out uh, to be potentially useful. We've still got to check all the parameters of it. 1795, the Canston giving land in Clinton in one of the Great Nine Partners lots. I want to say it's lot five, which would be inconvenient, but it could have been lot four to Eliphalat Platt, his son-in-law. So that would get us from the Great Nine Partners patentees, not the 1697 generation, but you know some of their successors, to the Platts, to the Gaisleys, to the Sealbacks, all the way down to the present generation custodians and owners of the house, which is uh, a wonderful response and uh, return on investment for a real shot in the dark. So with that, I am happy to take questions. If you folks on the, um, on the Zoom have questions, let um, Kathy know, and then she'll either send those through to Barbara or Barbara will read the chat. For those of you who are here with us today, you know, just raise your hands or shout something out. You know, either way, I'm good with it.
And if you don't have any questions, thank you so much for spending a Friday night with me in the wonderful Creek Meeting House. And please do everything you can to support the ongoing work to make sure that many future generations of Dutchess County can enjoy this iconic structure. Thank you very much. I'm going to stop my screen share. All right. I might be able to see. Doesn't look like we have any questions in the chat. You all can see that too. Do we have any questions in the audience? Yes. So we trace So the question is, the owners have actually done their own research into this, and I applaud them for that because not many owners of historic houses are quite that brave. This is why I'm always super careful when I go back into these deeds and I start with the present and work my way to the past. I think that the deeds you're referring to, which are from the Garretsons, which are early, like second or 1.5 generation patentees in there, I think those are sold to Benjamin Gaisley, who's Elathan Gaisley's father. And I think Benjamin sells them on to someone who's not their son. That's my working suspicion. I'm not completely 100% um, confident in that. But I will say one of the things that I didn't include tonight is that the initial deed that I was looking at thinking, oh, this is that property, turned out to be a dead end because Elathan bought it from a different fellow, and then sold it back to the same fellow a year later. This was the 1830s. Yeah. So it's like, oh, well, I guess that's a dead end. And that's pretty typical of the title searching process, because people in the past were just determined not to make anything easy for those of us 100 years later. All right. So we'll continue to look into that. Claudine and I are still working on this. We'll see what we can do. Yes. So the reference in 1831 of the house being there and the combination of that the 1823 uh, which you say may have shown that in an earlier style based on the house coming maybe in the 1790s suggests there was someone living there in the 1790s on. Do we know what they were doing on the 112 acres or what kind of farm it was? We don't unfortunately have that level of detail for that. So the question is, if you've got a house on there, say from, if my current suspicions are right, and the elder elephant Platt gets this land in 1795, it doesn't look like his predecessors had developed it. And that's a big part of these patents is that the land, large chunks of it tend to be undeveloped until the 1790s up to the 1820s because it's land speculation. So my suspicion is that if Elephant Platt got in the 1790s, he probably built a dwelling there and started farming it. Now we can't say exactly because these statistics were not kept. And unfortunately, one of the problems with freehold is it doesn't tell you what's going on. Now rent hold, what is called leasehold, which is what you encounter through most of Dutchess County in the 18th century, that will tell you about what's going on because it will tell you what the lease is being paid in. And normally it's wheat because you might have heard you know, statements that, ah, oh, Dutchess County was the breadbasket of Hudson Valley, especially during the revolution before that pesky Erie Canal was built. Well, friends, it was true because the real big cash crop, what most people grew throughout Dutchess County was wheat. That's what they paid their rent in. That's what they traded in at the various stores in Dutchess County. That was the big crop. So it's probably a wheat farm. But of course, we have a lot of diversification early in Dutchess County. You see apples where the ground and the climate is viable. You see sheep being raised. You see hogs being kept. So it wasn't the sort of 
monocrop farm that we might think of today, especially in the big industrial farms, but wheat up until 1827 and in some places into the 1830s and 40s was what was going on. Any other questions? Oh, I see Val Robadier has maps overlying the towns and the great okay. nine partners. Thank you, Val. Val is one of our great historians, Eastern Duchess. She is the town of Dover historian and also the uh, president of the Duchess, Gene Duchess County Genealogical Society. And Val is one of the great sports in the Duchess County history community because I send so many genealogical inquiries her way and she uh, never takes me to task for it. She's always very gracious. So thank you, Val. Any other questions, either online or here in the room? All right, hearing none. Thank you all very much for your time tonight. And uh, hope you folks online have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you. Good job.